Hello, Hopkins Community Church. Uh, if you're seeing this video, that means that uh, it is a blizzardy Sunday morning and we are not able to get here. And so I am kind of taking a chance on Thursday as I kind of think through and talk through the sermon uh, for the first time uh, to just record that and, and maybe offer that as what will be the sermon <laughs> For Sunday. So you're kind of getting a raw, unfiltered first talk through. Well, the weather looks more like that. Oh, you can't really see. Oh, there might be. Oh, yep. There's some blue sky right there. So that's uh, just remember that because I don't think we're going to see it again for a week or so. Um, anyways, uh, we are looking at the last part of Nehemiah this week. So Nehemiah chapters eight through 10, but really uh, through the end of the book, chapter 13. And to really set this off, I want to sort of set up the books of Ezra and Nehemiah together because originally, originally Ezra and Nehemiah were actually written as one unit. They're written uh, likely by the same author and they're set up with a very parallel design. There's actually four sort of parallel stories. And um, I kind of want to show you this. I'm actually going to share my screen. So the nice thing that I can do um, is I can actually share my notes with you. Um, and so I'm going to do that a second because the parallel design of Nehemiah is actually really cool. Um, what, what we get in each of each of these sections, so you'll see the three here, uh, the first part of Ezra, the second part of Ezra, and the third part of Ezra. We're going to talk about uh, uh, the, the third part, which is Nehemiah, which Pastor Caleb talked about last week, and then what we're going to talk about in more detail today is the fourth part of this book. So, but you can see that it's it's, it's set up with three very specific things. First, that each section talks about God sending a leader to Jerusalem. So, uh, and then you see that that leader faces some opposition when we've talked about that. And then there's this sort of anticlimactic ending. Um, and uh, each, so each of these sections kind of end with like this, sort of what what's going on uh it, it it just ends with some uncertainty um and so uh and and all that anticlimactic ending really stands kind of in opposition to the way that uh we have been thinking about uh the the prophetic message that has been given to Israel and the hope uh for the future that um that that God has placed right for a messianic king uh, which we know to be Jesus, for God's presence to return to, to the new temple, um, for God's kingdom to come over all of the nations, and for ultimately for the fulfillment of the promises of, of Abraham. So um, so let's just kind of run through this. This is by way of review real quick. Uh, Ezra 1 through 6, uh, King Cyrus issues a decree. He's moved by God, and he sends Zerubbabel and, and the, the first wave of exiles back to Jerusalem, and they go and they rebuild the temple. Um, and this is a this is a movement that uh, that is inspired by God, and it is it is one that Zerubbabel is called to do. And so they uh, they are given all of the resources they need. They go and they rebuild the temple. But when that temple is finished, it's finally rebuilt. Two things uh, happen, or or I guess perhaps don't happen. First is that God's presence, right? When when the temple was built the first time, God's presence comes down in a cloud and it fills the temple, and all the people fall down and worship. In the second temple, they build it, they dedicate it and nothing happens. God's presence does not come down into the temple. And so in that moment, there are there are elders, people that remember the first temple, and we see this sort of opposition to Zerubbabel's work and the fact that the temple has been built and people are weeping because of how not grand it is. They're weeping because of the fact that it doesn't look like and it doesn't really uh feel like the first temple uh and so at the end of that though uh what we get is that there are foreigners and uh israelites who didn't go into exile so uh some some people would classify these as samaritans some of them would be uh they, they might be uh jewish people who were left behind and maybe they intermarried maybe they didn't but they want to help in the midst of this, they want to help worship, they want to help build, they want to help serve. And Zerubbabel says, no, you have no part in the temple. 
And that's hard because it really stands in opposition to this right here, that all of the nations of the world would come to the house of the Lord and worship him. Right? Isaiah chapter 2 says this, that all uh, that they, they would all say, all of the nations of the world would say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord or to the temple of the Lord. And they all want to worship and they all want to learn. They want to be a part. And Zerubbabel says, you have no part in this temple. So it's a really kind of anticlimactic ending. It's like, wow, we built this temple and then God didn't show up. And by the way, we're also being very exclusive. Move on. Uh, 60 years to the second half of Ezra. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Artaxerxes sends Ezra to Jerusalem to teach the Torah. His, his job is to rebuild the community. Um, and, and then when he gets here, he finds out that the people have intermarried. So there's these quote unquote foreigners again. Um, and again, the, the word foreigner here can actually be referenced back to this right here. Foreigners and Israelites who didn't go into exile. So there's the people that went to Babylon and then they uh, they kind of have their uh, sort of uppity feelings about themselves because they went through it harder than maybe the people that were left behind or something like that. But they were intermarried. They were not keeping the law. <laughs> um, and then they, they come up with a solution. Remember, we talked about that. What was the solution to the to the people being intermarried? It's like, all, well, all the Jewish men should divorce their, their foreign wives and get rid of their mixed children, right? Because God, uh, right? Because God would go with that. No, he, he didn't. Um, and so uh, the, the the solution, right? They they divorce all the foreign women. The mixed children are all sent away. <laughs> and Ezra says, you have no part in Israel. <laughs> but remember that this is never commanded by God. And even though God values the holiness component of it, he also does not like and, and, and rails against divorce in particular. And, and uh, several of the prophets actually say this at different times. So <laughs> it's it's quite the thing, um, right? And, and, and it stands very much in opposition to this whole idea of God's kingdom coming over all the earth, over all the nations, and that all the people are coming to him. To they're, they're being a part of his people, right? God's kingdom is meant for everyone, not just for the Jewish people. And, you know, additionally, this sort of anticlimactic ending, not everyone even follows this solution. Um, and so that's how Ezra ends. It's like, hmm, everybody gets to, or a whole bunch of people get divorced. Not everyone follows the solution. The end. Hmm. Okay, move along to Nehemiah. So Nehemiah is sent by Artaxerxes uh, soon after Ezra, actually, uh, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He knows he he hears that the walls of Jerusalem are still in ruins, and. Uh, and, and so he gets sent back to rebuild the walls. Now, he faces opposition in a lot of ways from, from the foreigners and other people that are living around the land. Uh, so, you know, San, San Ballot and, and others that Pastor Caleb talked about last week. Um, and, and, and as he's building this, right, he's also saying in, 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 in a sense, you have no part in Jerusalem. Right? He's talking to these foreigners. He's talking to people who were not in exile, uh, people who have intermarried and whatever else. You have no part in Jerusalem. This part is not for you. And, and then he defends. He valiantly defends and builds the wall. But if you look back and, and think about what the prophets have said about the new Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem is, is, is a city without wall where people from all the nations could come and join in the covenant people and, and, and worship God and be there. Right. And it's the, it's the presence of a God that actually surrounds the city, not walls. And so we wonder in this moment, is this God's vision for Jerusalem or, or is this Nehemiah's vision for Jerusalem? And then it, it, it further, it begs the question, uh, the the whole conflict between between Nehemiah and the people the the, the Jews there and and Simbala and all the people around there could that have been avoided? We talked about how he prays, how he constantly goes to prayer in this, and and that's that's a good thing, right? That's a, there's there's a key learning there. But in the midst of that, we also go. Is is this is this God's vision for? the way that this is supposed to be because the prophetic hopes for 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 the future 
really had to do with with God's presence in his kingdom coming in his really I mean we we could we could quote the Lord's prayer your kingdom come and you will your will be done on earth as it is in heaven not in Jerusalem as it is in heaven but on earth as it is in heaven and the the promise that God gives to uh to Abraham in particular is right I'm going to bless you and all of the nations of the world will be blessed through you so that's that's the the review and 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 what happens then is we, we comes to kind of our fourth parallel and it's a little bit different um but it actually um it, it sort of sets up the beginning or the, the end of Nehemiah and it sets it up in a way that's familiar to us because <laughs> because uh this has already happened and so again uh we we go to scripture to the book of Nehemiah chapter eight, and, and you can read along with it on the screen, or you can grab your Bible at home and, and read along with it as well. But Nehemiah is in Jerusalem. They are re, they've rebuilt the walls. They've rebuilt the temple. Ezra is there too. And so now Ezra and Nehemiah join forces. And now that everybody is kind of settled into their towns and they've settled down and they have the walls and whatever else, uh, we see in verse one, uh, they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought out the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women who uh, who all were able to understand. He read aloud so that that able to understand is talking about a certain age. Uh, men and women of a, of a certain age, probably the, what we would consider maybe even to be the age of accountability. Uh, the, the, the boys had gone through the, the right of becoming an adult, the girls as well. Um, and, and so he read it aloud from daybreak until noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Right. So if you ever complained about my sermon or Pastor Jim's sermon or, or Pastor Caleb, you know, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, I joke. I joke. I, I'm reminded often that uh, I, I probably shouldn't joke about this, but just for the record, daybreak to noon, and they stood the entire time. So Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood, there was a bunch of people uh, that all stood with him. Ezra opened the book and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. As he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra play, praised the Lord the great God, and all the people lifted up their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And again, there's a bunch of Levites there. We see in, in verse seven, they instructed the people as they were standing there, they read from the book of the law, they made it clear and, and were giving meaning so the people could understood uh, could understand what was being written. And then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priests uh, and teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said, this is this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So let's let's pause there for a second. They were weeping because they're hearing the words of the law. And, and likely what's going on right now, because this is like post-exile, is that they're realizing what has happened. They're realizing uh, why they ended up going into exile in the first place. They're realizing uh, the, the the punishment that God had given them and, and the fact that it was just because God actually had said that if you don't do this, your enemies will take you from this land. And now they're back. But if you remember, if you remember back in the end of Ezra, we remember that uh, it's it's very clear that the, the people are still sinning. They're still sinful. Right? They're they're still doing things that that were forbidden in the book of the law, and so how are they supposed to reconcile that? They are back in <laughs> the land, but they but they're still struggling with sin. They're still breaking the law. So in the midst of this, uh, Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah, the governor, uh, says, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks uh, and send some of those who ha uh, have nothing prepared. Uh, uh, this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that's a big deal. So they're, they're encouraging people, don't, don't weep, don't weep, don't weep, don't grieve, right? Instead, they what they do is they go out, they have a party, they celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. So, right, 
regardless of what happened in the past, now they understand. This is a beautiful image of like the the old versus the new, right? You, we we all have a past. You you have a past. I have a past. We all have a past. And 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 I would be willing to bet uh, that you did some dumb things in your past, just like I have done some dumb things in my past. But this is a beautiful image of us not being defined by that anymore, right? We can weep over those things. We can weep over the transgressions that we have made. And and, and surely that is a good thing because God calls us to, to shed that stuff. That is, that, that needs to be gone, but it also needs to be confessed. Right? But now Nehemiah is saying, okay, we understand this. Now we can move forward and, and great. Like that's awesome. So, they they have a they have a feast and then the second day uh, they give attention to the word they found written in the book of law uh, the the writing uh, of, from Moses about the feast of the tabernacles so they're supposed to live in temporary shelters this was to remind them of their their when they wandered in the wilderness and and now probably even remind them of their time in exile when they weren't home and and how God was faithful to them. And so they do this and they 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 build these temporary shelters. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or uh and and they they live in these temporary shelters and they do this for 7 days. And uh they 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 celebrate this and they celebrate it uh in a way that hadn't been done since Joshua. So Joshua, remember Joshua uh who fought the battle of Jericho and and all of that. Right. This is we're talking about hundreds of years, uh, several hundred, two, three, four hundred years, probably um, for. Yeah, probably more likely 400 years uh, since that had happened. And so they uh, they do this. Uh, and, and part of the Feast of Tabernacles was very much about remembering God's faithfulness, remembering that in the midst of all of the, the, the things that had been going on, wandering in the wilderness or Egypt, even in exile, to remember that God is the faithful God. So, so they do this. Uh, and then uh, they they gather again uh, and celebrate another festival uh, and have a celebration even on the eighth day, which brings us to chapter nine. And in response to this, they in, in response to remembering what God has done for them, there is a great corporate confession of sins. And, and I would encourage you, uh, you can either do this now or do it after the fact, but I would encourage you to read chapter nine because it's really, really beautiful. And we've said this before. How do we know that God's going to be faithful in the future? It's by looking at God's faithfulness in the past. Every one of us is here because of God's faithfulness. We are at where at where we are today because of God's faithfulness. He has been faithful to us in keeping his promises to us, in keeping his promises to, to his people, in keeping his promises to Abraham. Right. And he has he has done this. And, and because he is continually and constantly faithful, we know that he will be continually and constantly faithful. And so they pray this really great prayer of confession, which is also a prayer of remembering. And uh, I would encourage you to read uh, Nehemiah 9. They gather, they're wearing sackcloth on their heads, uh, but they, they, re, um, they, they, together, they praise the Lord and they, they pray. Uh, they remember, uh, you are the God who chose Abraham out of the, Ur of the Chaldeans. Uh, you saw our suffering in Egypt. You came down from on Mount Sinai. Uh, and then it goes into, but our ancestors became arrogant and stiff-necked. They did not obey your commands. Uh, they they cast themselves before an image uh, of gold, right? That's the the, the golden calf. Um, um, but uh, it goes on to say, but you did not abandon them in the wilderness. Uh, you guided them. Um, you gave them kingdoms and nations, the the remotest frontiers, right? He's talking about uh, talking about even during the time of King David. He's talking about the time. Well, before that, when Joshua uh, helped, or when when he when God uh, removed all of the nations from before them, and even still, it says, verse twenty six, even still we were disobedient; we didn't obey your laws. We killed the prophets, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, you warned us to turn back, and dis but we disobeyed. Uh, now, Lord God, you are mighty and awesome. You keep your covenant. Do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come on us, on our kings and leaders, on our priests and prophets, on our ancestors and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until today. It has all happened to us, but you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully. We have acted wickedly. 
And so, right, that's that's really, really the crux of that that passage. And it's really beautiful. Verses 32, 33, right through there is is just, just beautiful. They confess their sins. And then they move into chapter 10, which is a, a time of, of covenant renewal. In view of this, we make a binding agreement. We're putting it on uh, in writing on our leaders today. They say, we are going to serve the Lord. We are going to assume responsibility. We are going to, uh, we are going to uh, bring in our tithes and our first fruits. We are going to do all of these things. We are recommitting this day. Uh, and when we're making it a covenant, <laughs> and it ends with, we will not neglect the house of our God. Wow. Like it is, it is such a beautiful, beautiful moment of a realization of sin and a, and a confession and turning and sort of recommitment. And it really is a beautiful thing. And then we move on because that's not the end of Nehemiah. That would be awesome. If this was the end of Nehemiah, it would be a really high point. But like the first three sort of parallel stories, the end of Nehemiah is just as anticlimactic. And so if you go and we were to read uh, chapters 11 and 12, we see all of the new residents that move into Jerusalem. We see all of them getting settled down. There are new priests and Levites and they're ordained and, and, and whatever, well, we call them ordained or they're dedicated. Something happens, right? And they are all put in charge of the temple. And, and then there's a list of the priestly families and, and they're kind of given their, their service. And then there's a dedication of the wall of Jerusalem they they spend time, uh, you know, honoring God for that and honoring all of the people that have worked hard to get them to this point, right? They are in the land, they are in the city, they have the temple, they have the law, they have the wall, they've done the ordinations, they've done all the ceremonies, they've done all of the religious things, right? Wow, good for them. Yay, yay, Jewish people. They've right, they've 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 come back and they've they've done everything that they can to set up things as they were before they were brought into exile and that right there like uh, intentionally phrasing it that way right they have intentionally come back and set up everything the way it was before they went into exile do you think that that worked for them right because the way things were before they went into exile caused them to go into exile. And so we move into chapter 13. And chapter 13 is called Nehemiah's Final Reforms. And I'm going to just give you uh, a very brief, <laughs> a brief summary of Nehemiah's Final Reforms. So Nehemiah actually went, goes back to Babylon or uh, goes back to the king of Persia and he's there for a little while. And then he comes back again and, and he's, he comes back and he's surveying the city. And this is what he finds out. He finds out that the temple is being neglected. Zerubbabel's work, all, the, all of Zerubbabel's work to build the second temple is, is undone. The temple is being neglected. The people that put in charge of it are taking advantage of it. And, 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 and Nehemiah goes ballistic and throws these people out of the temple and he has everything cleansed and whatever else. And, and then uh, he's going around the city and he finds out that the people are violating the Torah. They're working on the Sabbath. There's still people that are intermarried. Ezra's work is undone, right? They have the Torah. They were read, it was read to them, right? And they said they were going to follow it. And here we are. And Ezra is again, so angry and he's beating people, and he's yelling at them, follow the Torah, follow the Torah, obey the Torah, right? <laughs> and then he continues to go by the city, and he sees that even his own work, Nehemiah's work on the wall is undone. People have set up markets within the sight of the walls. They are working on the Sabbath, and his own walls, everything that he has done to, to rebuild the walls and to protect the city is undone. And so he starts Right, his response, his response is uh, super, uh, super spiritual. Nehemiah goes on a rampage. He is beating people up. He is pulling hair out of their head. 
He is making them swear oaths to never disobey again. Have you ever done that with your kids? Hey, just stop being selfish, right? Just stop being selfish. That's what you need to do. You just need to stop being selfish <laughs> because that always has worked for, uh, maybe it works for your kids. It doesn't work for my kids, uh, be, <laughs> right? Uh, and he's yelling at them, obey the Torah, obey the Torah. And then, <laughs> and then in the midst of this, we see Nehemiah praying and in, and four times he prays, remember me, my God, remember me, my God. And and the, 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 the sort of summary of why he's saying this is, at least I tried. <laughs> at least I tried. Remember me, my God, with favor. At least I tried. And so it really... It, that's the end of the book. The, the, the book, Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, really, it actually ends with this, right? I he, he beats a bunch of people up. He pulls out their hair. He yells at them. He makes them swear oaths to not disobey again. He, he, he goes through all the, the purification rites and all the things. And then he says at the end of this, remember me with favor, my God. The end. And we're kind of just left hanging. And we're kind of left with this sort of cliffhanger thing where it's like, okay, what, what just happened? And in, in, in reality, that's kind of the point. Because if we are to look at the, the heart of the matter, we have to understand that it is a matter of the heart. See, the book begins with hope but it ends in disappointment, right? The hope is, right, God hasn't forgotten his people. And so he he uh, stirs up the heart of Cyrus and then later the heart of Artaxerxes and he sends people back to the land. They get to return to the land and they rebuilt everything, like we said, as it was before. But the problem is that the spiritual state of the people is actually unchanged. And it didn't matter that they had a physical temple. It didn't matter that they had walls around Jerusalem. It's actually probably a, more of a, a negative thing, actually. It didn't matter that they were in the land. It didn't even matter that they were reading the Torah and, and being told what the law was. In the end, the spiritual state of people was unchanged. And the heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. And the issue was not that they didn't have the law. The issue was not that they were not in Jerusalem. The issue was that they were sinful, right? Even Nehemiah, at the end of this, right, at the end of the thing, he's literally saying, remember me, my God, remember me. At least I tried. At least I tried. Like, I'm just trying to do my best, right? In, in some cases, you, you almost start to wonder, is Nehemiah just as selfish and sinful as everyone else, because it seems like he's doing all of these things to make sure that he is right and good and pure and just. And yet the way that he goes about it is not right, not pure and not just. And it's like, he's trying to do all of the, the right religious things by way of the law to make sure that at, at the very least, at the end of the day, he's in good graces with God, even if no one else is. Yeah. Like, all of this should should constitute a, a level of like tension in our minds and in our hearts because realistically and, and, and maybe maybe we know this because of our like our place after the cross after Jesus but we, we kind of missed the whole point here i think we see this in the pharisees too uh that that they are so hyper focused on keeping the law that they completely miss the whole point of like loving God and loving neighbor. That they completely miss the whole point of um, the fact that sin is the issue. And so, right? They the book begins with hope, but it ends in disappointment. They had rebuilt everything just the way it was before. They had instituted a number of social and political reforms that are put into place, but they, they don't address the issues of the heart, namely sin. And that's that's sort of the reality of it. 
you you cannot legislate sin out of people's hearts right it doesn't matter what cultural norms or cultural reforms or social reforms or anything that you put into place you you cannot through any human means remove the sin from people's hearts and that's why what is actually highlighted without being said in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah is that it is is literally what's being spoken in the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and what does God say there right Jeremiah 31 Ezekiel 36 to address sin heart transformation is actually what's necessary right sin isn't moved through legislation it isn't removed through cultural social revolution to address sin the people need a messiah they need forgiveness they need healing they need the holy spirit they need to be discipled they need to be in this this sort of relationship where the, the they need to be in, in in a situation in a spot where the law of god is what is revealing our need for the messiah so that we can come to him and find salvation this is the whole point of what Jesus does. Without Jesus, without the Spirit, we are completely hopeless. Without God's intervention of building faith in us and bringing us to faith in Jesus and providing for us through faith in Jesus Christ, his grace and forgiveness of sins, right? He, well, he provides grace through faith, right? That is, that is the the point it is by grace you have been saved through faith it's not of yourself it is a gift of god not by works right not by keeping the law so that no one can boast the reality is it doesn't it doesn't matter at the end of the day it doesn't it doesn't matter what legislation goes through it it, it doesn't matter who's driving the culture right it doesn't even it doesn't even matter if you do all of the right religious things. I mean, like Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra did everything they could to do all of the right religious things, right? All of it. They they, they rebuild the temple, Zerubbabel. They they read the law. They 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 build the wall and, and dedicate everything. They do all the religious ceremonies and whatever else. And uh, it, uh, it, nothing. It, it amounts to nothing but a hill of beans because they completely missed the point. Or perhaps that is the point. That God is showing them that all of this isn't enough. And all of it points to the need for a Messiah. Um, it's, it's really quite interesting if we take this and maybe apply it to our current circumstances. Now, two weeks in a row, two, two preaching weeks in a row, because I, I didn't preach last week, but two weeks ago, uh, I said, never has there ever been a better setup for this Making Life Disciples curriculum than the end of Ezra. <laughs> and now that we're in the end of Nehemiah, I would say, never has there ever been a better setup for the need for the Making Life Disciples curriculum as the end of Nehemiah. Because if if we are to look at this and we are to think about this, we aren't so different, are we? right? We've talked about this before. I've used this as an example in the past, right? If we just got back to the good old days, then things would be better, right? Whatever the good old days are, remember before COVID, or maybe it's the 50s, or maybe it's the 1800s, or or maybe, I don't know, I don't know when the good old days are. Maybe it's like 34 AD when the church is just starting out. I don't know what the good old days are, right? If, if we just go back there, though, then it would be better, right? If or, or, or to, to coin a, a bit of a, a phrase from Nehemiah, if we build it back the way it was before, then we'll be good. Right? Or we say, we just need to have so-and-so in the White House, or we just need to have control of Congress, or we just need to have, a, you know, whatever majority in the in the Supreme Court. There's there's so many things that we say. And if, if we just get that, then things will be better. But friends, realistically, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on. And it doesn't matter what presidential candidate you support. We have had Democratic presidents who have complete control of Congress and Democratic presidents who haven't. We've had Republican presidents who have had complete control of Congress and we have Republican presidents who haven't. We have had liberal 
like we've had more liberal Supreme Court and we've had more conservative Supreme Court. And are, did have people stopped sinning? No, they haven't. Are we better now than we were before because we have any one of these things? No, we're not. And as such, it shouldn't be the focus of our faith or our messaging. Right? Or, or we could even go to the, the other side of, of what Nehemiah does and says, you know, he goes to people and he yells at them and he shakes his fist. Obey the Torah. Just obey the Torah. Oh my gosh. What are you doing? Just obey the law of God. Right. And then everything will be better. Just That's all you got to do. Just follow the religious check boxes and you're going to be fine. Right. <laughs> we see if people just come to church on Sunday, they'd stop sinning, but they'd be better or something like that. Right. <laughs> or, you know, you know, in 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 reference to this this making life disciples thing, so I'm going to make a video for this too, just in case. But right, it, it, the right the the whole crux of of this the second episode of this talks about the, the sort of facts and reality behind abortion and how far too often what what do we we say? Oh well, as soon as if we could just get Roe v. Wade to go away, then then things will be better. It's been over a year. It's almost, it's been, well, not quite a year. It's been a while. Uh, 2020, it's been, it's been a year and a half. And are things better? Right? Have people stopped singing, sinning? Have abortions stopped happening? Right? Or, or maybe if we just had this constitutional amendment to not have abortion in our state, then, then it would be fine. People wouldn't be able to do it anymore, right? Never mind the fact that they can travel. Right, because again, you can't. It, is it good? Sure, it's good. Right, we, we don't want our institutions to be pro sin. Obviously, I, you know, I'm not. I'm not. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, dog on that because that's not. That's not the point. But in reality, right, so many times we've gotten so hung up about these legislative decisions or these Supreme Court decisions. And, and saying, well, people just need to, you know, it just needs to be illegal and then, and that will make it better. And in reality, there were millions of illegal abortions happening before Roe v. Wade. There were millions of abortion, abortions happening during Roe v. Wade. And there were millions of abortions, there are millions of abortions happening now, even in states where it's legal. Because it's a sin issue. And a sin issue is a heart issue. I'm just going to leave you with a leave you with a quote from the Making Life Disciples book. Right? It says, in a society under oppressive Roman rule, Jesus focused his time on showing compassion one to one, actively ministering to the needs of hurting individuals. Sounds kind of like the Micah 6, 8 passage, right? Seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. It feels a little bit like the Beatitudes we talked about last week too. That we posture ourselves in a way where we are, we are ministering to broken people out of the redemption and, and salvation that we have and experience. And that when we miss the path a little bit, and focus more as a as a church or and the people of God, as it, it, in seeking legal or political or social or cultural things to stop and stem the tide of sin, we are doing a disservice to the, the the world that is lost around us because in reality they need Jesus we need Jesus and we can even say well okay well that was Jesus but you know what happens after what happens after Jesus and in, in reality, the, the early church followed followed suit. They followed the Great Commission to go and make 
disciples. And they did it in the midst of an aggressive anti-Christian empire where, where the Roman Empire was actually seeking these people out and then actively killing them. Like they didn't seek to get their people elected. They didn't seek to put them in office. Paul, even when Paul is facing the Roman, uh, the Roman authorities, right? He gets called out by one of the uh, by one of the the local Roman authorities because Paul's defense is the gospel. He literally preaches the gospel to this guy, and the and, and the guy goes, "Do you think that?" In like one hour, you're going to make me a disciple of this Jesus? It's truly amazing. How I I, I really truly feel like the church has been in, in many ways duped into being this, this whatever we've been labeled as sort of this evangelical voting block. And we've been duped into to serving this thing rather than recognizing the true need in the culture today, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. And that's the point, the point that is made. And I think it's made over and over and over again as we come to the close of the Old Testament, which in, in two weeks we will... We will fi finish our, our move through the Old Testament and, and make the transition into the New Testament. But what we see time and time and time again in the Old Testament is that sin is the issue. Right? Adam and Eve, who literally walked with God, sin is the issue. Noah, who is kind of the sort of like archetypal savior of humanity in some sense, Sin is the issue. Abraham, who is called by God and, and blessed by God, right, still has sin issues, still doesn't trust God. Jacob. And we can go on from there. But over and over and over again, the point of the Old Testament is to point to the need for a Savior. And we see this again. right? They're brought into a land. They're given the land, the promised land. God fulfills his promise in that way. But having the land isn't the end. Okay. And when they're brought back to the land, by having the land, rebuilding it the way it was before, is not the point. And so the point, then, that we need to be aware of the anticlimactic tension that is present at the end of Ezra and Nehemiah is quite simply that, that we, like the people of Israel, need a savior. That we can't do it on our own, nor have we ever been able to do it on our own. And that the first and foremost priority of the people of God and of the church is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I would say that now that also brings in the idea of believing in Jesus Christ. Right? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then love your neighbor, which I would also say brings in the great commission of go and make disciples of all nations. That, friends, is the call of the church. First and foremost, all of these other things are secondary. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the many ways in which you have and continue to allow us to be witnesses for you in all of the different arenas and spheres of our lives. Father, we pray that you would help us as your people to keep your gospel at the center of
who we are, of what we do, and of what we proclaim, that the first message out of our mouths would be that of Jesus. And Lord, that that message would resound in our lives and in our community to bring people who are lost in darkness uh, into the light. And that people who are seeking would find you. Give us boldness and courage to stand on this message in the midst of all of the other things that swirl around us in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you are watching this, there are going to be some links below uh, to um, songs and, and whatever else that would be. We, we did this during the, the kind of COVID era too, when we were shut down for those couple of weeks, a couple of songs uh, to go along with this message and stuff. And I invite you to, to listen to them, sing along with them. That would be the songs that we uh, would have sung this week. And um, we look forward to seeing you Sunday also, or next Sunday, also in the links below, you will, um, you will see a link to uh, making life disciples session two. Uh, which I'm going to record uh, a little bit later as well uh, if we don't have um, church on Sunday. Uh, and you can you can see that there'll be uh, a link to that video along with the, the content that goes along with that too. So um, I hope that you are safe. I hope that you are warm. I hope that you have power. And I pray that uh, that God would <laughs> grant us a reprieve from the snow and that we would be able to meet together again uh, next week. And until then though, May God bless you and keep you. In Jesus' name.